Well, hello again, everyone. It's good to see. Uh, I can't see you, but I guess you can see me. But it's good to be with you. And we're down to the last of the churches, the Church of Laodicea, which is our era, the 20th and into the 21st century. And so we'll find that this should be familiar to us more than some of the others, although uh, Lesson 9 was... Um, into our grandparents' time and my parents' time more. But um, the, this one, the letter to Laodicea, brings us right into our own era. This will be lesson number 10, if you're, uh, and they're all found in Revelation to John in the groups on Facebook, and they're all numbered. So if you're just starting, and this is the first one you've seen, uh, I'd invite you to go back to lesson one and, and follow through. And um, I'm going to do a review of the Letters to Seven Churches uh, next after I finish this one. And it'll uh, give us a very quick overview, but uh, it's not going to be complete. So I encourage everyone to go through this and uh, and persevere because it's uh, it may be you find it a little heavy going, but it's okay. Now the city of Laodicea is about a hundred miles directly east of Ephesus, and uh, it was a city uh, like a tri-city area uh, near Colossus, to which Paul's letter to the Colossians, Colossians was written, and uh, Hierapolis, and it was famous throughout the Roman province of Asia as a center of wealth, a uh, real bustling commerce area, lots of activity. Also, the medical center was there, and many large, beautiful homes were built in Laodicea. The ruins of these, if you go to the Middle East, they tell me, I've never been there, but they tell me that you can still find some of the ruins of these uh, ancient homes, and they were very expensive homes. And some of them would have been owned by Christians as well as everybody else in that city. There was a textile uh, industry, clothing industry, and it was flourishing in Laodicea. And they also had a, a special breed of black sheep that was raised in the area. And this glossy black wool was highly, uh, highly desired. It, was, uh, it had a, a, a real gloss to it. And they also had a medical school uh, where they made uh, looked at eyes, and they had eye salve, salve there. They made salve. So as a center of wealth and commerce and medicine, it was, it was a very bustling, busy, prosperous city. As in all the previous letters, our Lord introduced himself, and, and in this letter, he... He introduced himself. He is the, in his opening lines, the Lord gives the Laodicean believers the key to what, what they need. And I'm going to read from chapter 3 of Revelation, being, uh, reading now uh, verse number 14. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. First thing that Jesus says, that he is the Amen. Amen is the last word in the, in the mark of trustworthiness. When he says he's the Amen, he is the last word. He is trustworthy. He is the, he is truth. And the word, the word of Jesus in this last word uh, also says he's the reliable truth, the amen. Second, he calls himself the faithful and true witness. He has emphasized through his truthfulness in uh, some of the previous letters, but here he adds the word faithful to stress the fact that he's not only the tells the truth, but he tells the hard truth. He do, doesn't make it easy. He doesn't gloss it over. 
he speaks plainly, clearly, and he reveals to the church everything the church needs to know and that needs to understand. Because of uh, it's confrontational, but he says it anyway. The, in this letter, the Lord wants the Laodicean church to be very much aware of the of his truthfulness and faithfulness and this side of his nature. Also, we should note that the Lord does not use the word creation merely to refer to the old creation, the physical universe the, that he started in, in the book of uh, Genesis and, and that creation, although he is the God of that, the God of the galaxies and the planets, the sun and the earth and, and all, all, this, all the creation, the whole universe. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, we are part of a new world. The Lord is bringing a new world into being. And something he's, he's already begun. He has already come. The truth, this is the truth that the Church of Laodicea desperately need to appreciate to get to understand. And in the letter to the Colossians, Paul adds, after this letter has been read to you in Colossus, see that it's also read to the church in Laodicea. So the the church in Laodicea was a concern of Paul and of course is the concern of our Lord as he addresses this church um, in this letter. The church in Laodicea needed to be told the important truth. It was painful truth, and the truth they needed to hear nonetheless, and how this church should relate to God in the new creation. Now, for the seventh and last time in Revelation, we encounter this, this term that's been with all letters, is, I know your deeds. And so in verses uh, 15 16 of chapter 3, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, these, these are harsh words. They should be chilling words to the, the people hearing these opening lines. He said, I know your, your deeds. So when the Lord says, I know your deeds, to the church in Philadelphia, it was cause for rejoicing. But when he used these same words to this church in Laodicea, it should have been a cause for mourning. The Lord had been watching this church in Laodicea. And what he saw was, was not making him happy. It was not pleasing. There were problems in this church in Laodicea. First, there was something tragically lacking in their commitment. They, they had very little commitment, no commitment. They weren't hot or cold. You're neither hot or cold, so it's like a drink. You would, If it's not hot or cold, lukewarm, you would spit it out. You want your tea hot. You want your cold drink cold. And so if you get something you turn on the tap, for example, and you forget to let the water run a little bit, and you take a drink, what do you do? You, you spit it out, you dump the water out of the glass, let the water run and get a cold drink. Now, archaeologists have discovered an interesting fact about the city of Laodicea. The source of the city's water supply was a hot spring about six miles outside the city. And the word spit is a very weak translation. Uh, the could be word, and, and some of the other meanings of that word that was used would be vomit. He's not saying that it's just going to spit you, uh, spit you out. He, he's saying it would violently vomit you out. So how did this congregation get into this state? You know, I think the one word that, supply, uh, that uh, describes the state they were in and how they got there was compromise. 
So what was the issues they were compromising on? They were compromising on doctrine. They were compromising the truth. They were con con compromising uh, their spirituality for the sake of comfort. They found that they were uh, they were watering things down. And they want to keep peace in the church. So it's easier, isn't it? They just water things down. Don't bring up the controversial things. And don't stir things up. And so they had little truth mixed with all this restraint that they had in their, in their church. So the Laodicean church was, I guess, what you call a comfortable church. Nobody was riled up. Uh, you could attend there and probably find it pleasurable. Uh, you would never be challenged or, or uh, rebuked or corrected. Uh, you would uh, only be uh, kind of flattered and, and stroked a little bit. And what does God, uh, Jesus think of such a church? He said, I'm about to spew you about vomit you out of my mouth. The people may love the lukewarm climate in Laodicea, but Jesus does not. It makes them comfortable, but it makes our Lord sick. And the tragedy of this Laodicean church and the experience that it's going through is this being repeated again and again in thousands of churches around the world. Remember, this Laodicean church is us as well as the church back in this first century. This is us. So the Laodicean, Laodiceans were comfortable. And even worse, they were, they had, they accepted it. They thought they were fine. They were complacent. And what one commentator referred to them as, as being smug. And I'm going on to verse 17, chapter 3. It says, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need thing, a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Notice the difference here. You say, and you are. The message is, you say you're rich, but the Lord says you are poor. And the faithful and true witness, Jesus himself, has set the truth before this church, the whole truth, and it must have hurt. To use your popular expression, laying in church was fat, dumb, and happy. It was... They were smug, self-sufficient, complacent. And these poor people in this church, they, they were poor, and they didn't realize how uh, spiritually poor they were. They had no idea that the trouble they were in. After all, the lady to see in the economy was just humming along beautifully. The people had lots of money, nice homes, plenty to eat. Put that into our 20, 20th and 21st century culture, would say they had a beautiful sanctuary with padded mahogany pews, a mighty public organ, a golden, uh, a, a beautiful choir, uh, a dynamic, entertaining preacher, and the, the wealthiest, the most prominent people were attending the church and they were donating to the church. And this, ch these, this church had respect of the entire community. And the church thought they were doing extremely well. But the Lord, in whose name they were supposed to be gathering in, looked at their, their rich, sumptuous, comfortable, complacent church and said, You are wretched. You are pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And this comes up to our present time. The church then and the church now is not a country club and is not operating for the benefits of its members. Now, Jesus has already told us what the church is to be like, is to be salt. Not, not just salt, but salty salt. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if a salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except be thrown out and trampled by men. 
a church that is salt should be salty. Like salt, which is when you put it on your food. The church should be dispersed throughout the community and throughout the world, flavoring everything it touches. And this church is, the church is to function not only when it gathers together on, on Sunday, but during the week. Its members, that's you and I, should be out in the marketplace, the business offices, the shops, the neighborhood. There in the outside world is where the real work of the church is done. In our denomination, the church I belong to, we are again rising up uh, deacons that remain deacons all their lives to do the work outside the church, not so much in the church. The church is also called to be not just salt, but is to be light. Jesus tells people, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And light is a symbol of truth. So we should be light, but we should proclaiming the truth. The church should be the source of truth, enlightening the world with the gospel. And by this standard, the Laodicean church, in our Lord's terms and what they really were, was wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. It thought itself rich. They thought they were doing good. But actually, they had nothing. And this letter and all this of previous letters that we've gone through, we must kind of step back and take a long view of church history. Each of the seven churches of Revelation, as we've said many times, and, and every, every one of these churches, represented a time uh, in the church history and uh, the atmosphere, atmosphere of the worldwide Christian church and the conditions there. And we look back across the 20th, 20th and 21st century church history, we can also see how accurate in each of these uh, prophetic uh, symbols have been for each church in the era that they represent. And now we come to this church, this uh, seventh church, the seventh age of the church, the Laodicean period. It is clear as both history and prophecy confirm this, that the Laodicean uh, church is similar to the 20th and 21st century, the last age of the church. That's our age. The Laodicean period is characterized by people dictating what will be taught in the church rather than submitting to the authority of the Word of God. And I believe that the name Laodicea means some, some wrote judgment of people or uh, people's rights for, isn't that what we talk about in our time? People's rights. Be, uh, Laodiceans telling their ministers what to preach. And we see this happening today. The Apostle Paul predicted in his second letter to Timothy, that in the last days men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will want to hear what, what meets their desires. They will gather around a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. And we can see this taking place around us. There used to be a time when the church taught that the, the natural self with which, with which we are born needed to be crucified, denied kept under careful control. Jesus said, if any would come out, anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And yet, we live in a day that is totally opposite of that. Churches are openly advancing the self-teaching and the uh, power and possibilities of self and a part, not teaching new birth in Christ. In the age 
we're in this age of compromise, compromises in the church. The church in the 21st century is fast becoming a drifting church, a lukewarm church. Uh, a church that makes, makes God sick. Once, uh, once upon a time, as we referred to, uh, saw the, uh, the, the previous letter, the church had a, a desire to evangelize the world, to save the lost. So today, that desire has cooled in many churches. Pastors may be telling their churches and their, con their congregation that God is too loving to condemn anyone to an eternal separation from himself. They say that good people who live good lives, even though they live apart from Jesus, will still be saved. The church in our, our 20th and 21st century is drifting away from the biblical truths that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, from God's standards. And that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, and that's in John chapter 14. And even though the lostness of mankind is made unmistakably plain uh, in scriptures, we see the rise of crime. We see plagues. We see drug abuse. The failure of morality. The increasing pollution of our planet. We see compromising Christians in complacent churches preaching and listening to a feel-good uh, gospel that has nothing to do with the true gospel of, of, the, of the scriptures, of the Bible. It, we're not hearing in some of our churches the good news of salvation and by grace through faith are we saved through and through the blood of Jesus Christ. And here we are. We find that Christians are suggesting that killing unborn babies can, it should be condoned. We see many churches moving in that direction. We see people not getting married anymore. We see a lot of discussion, and we actually see it taking place in euthanasia. People, uh, well, they're old. Let's just put, give them a big needle, put them out of their misery. And we actually see people saying, well, this is what I should do. I should get off the planet, make room for others, and I, I don't want to, to suffer or anything. Uh, I, I just, just put me out of my misery. And not holding life as being sacred and allowing God to deal with these things. We are in a mess. And the the Lord concludes his letters to this Laodicean church with an urgent appeal. It says, I, in verse 18, chapter 3, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. The key to this verse are those little words, buy for me. This is something that the Lord wants us to grasp. He has everything we need to live, to thrive, and to function. He is completely sufficient to supply all our needs, both in the church and individually as, in, as believers. The Lord knows our real needs, our truest needs, deepest needs, gold, white clothing, I salve. And these things are symbols of spiritual realities, realities that we desperately need in our lives. The Lord alone is the source of these spiritual, spiritual possessions, and he makes them available to us. Whether we are material, materially rich and socially respected, or whether we are poor, persecuted, haunted, oppressed, and being put to death. The first of these spiritual possessions that we find is, of course, the gold refined in fire. 
the Laodiceans were secure, self-sufficient in their own prosperity. They had ceased to live by the refined gold of faith in Jesus Christ alone. So the, the gold is the faith, refined gold is faith. The second of these spiritual gifts, uh, possessions, is white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. Everyone is morally naked before God. And so we need to, to cover our spiritual nakedness. He sees us. He sees our shames. And he offers to clothe us with the righteousness of Jesus, his son. Throughout these letters, we see the white clothes stand for redemption, for righteousness that we receive from Jesus Christ. The third uh, spiritual possession is I have. Notice, first of all, that the Lord uses an analogy from everyday experience of the people that he's addressing. Because we learned earlier here, what I was saying is that we, they had a medical school there and there was a, a place where they made an ISAV so that they enabled people to see better. And when the anointing spirit of Christ lives within our eyes, they are open to understand the word of God and see the Bible in a new and fresh and penetrating way. Now, sometimes we have trouble understanding the Bible. Then maybe we do need to ask ourselves, do I have the spirit of truth in my, in my life, in my thinking? Or have I not yet come to Jesus and received that anointing salve, which will open my eyes to see? And that truly is the most tremendous and faithful question each of us must ask within our hearts. Have I received Jesus? And so we find that the invitation comes in the next verse to receive Jesus. Verse chapter 3, 19 and 20, and I am reading from the New International Version. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Isn't this a wonderful expression of God's love? God approaches this church with this, this church that has this smugness, complacency, this feely church and says, I love you. And the reason I rebuke you, the reason I am speaking so, giving you the top words, I want to discipline you. And I'm doing this because I care for you. The thing that we get from this verse is we need to realize that Jesus is, in a sense, he's standing outside wanting to come in. We have to open the door. We've seen that painting where Jesus is standing outside the door and knocking, and there's no doorknob on the outside. We have to open the door to let Jesus come in. And as I said, he will not open the door. We have to open the door. And the next thing is that Jesus, uh, when we open the door and he enters, he promises that when we invite him, he will come into our lives. He will change us. We will be, have a relationship with Jesus when he comes in. We will have fellowship with him. He will, we will dine with him. We will have communion. We'll be together in the same place. Now, verses 21, 22, chapter 3. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcome and sit down with my father on his throne, he, will have, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus promises that we will share in his reign. The true church will one day reign with Christ. Isn't that wonderful news? We will reign with Christ. And to this Laodicean church, 
he's saying, and it sums it up, he's saying, not to just the Laodicean church, because we are Laodicean church in a sense, we are in the Laodicean era of the church. Don't yield to complacency. Jesus says, invite me in, in our lives, into our church. Let, Jesus says, let me revolutionize and transform your life. If you do, you will have a, a, a position, reigning position in the age to come. Sober by the knowledge that we live in lukewarm latency in age of church history. Let's stir ourselves up and stir one another up and let's become the, the church, that's you and me, let us become the church that we are called to be, to be the salt and to be the light in the world and not water things down, not be complacent, but to go out and revolutionize the world for Christ. We will continue on. Uh, this sort of ends our letters to the seven churches. Uh, I'm going to try to open, I purposely, and I don't think you can make too many comments on, on the, uh, on this Bible study on the, on, on the uh, site that we have in the group sites. Uh, but uh, after we get through the, the thing, I can open it up and let people kind of put their 10 cents worth in. And uh, we hope that uh, you're really getting something out of this. This is uh, take, this takes us through the letters of seven churches, and then we move on to things that take place after this. And so we're getting into the the things that what will be. But before I do that, I'm going to take the next session, and I'm going to do, do a very quick review of all the the seven churches, and then we'll move into the, the throne room of, of, uh, of, of God, and we're going to uh, see the things to come. So may, I hope this is a blessing to you, and I encourage each of you to go back once in a while, and uh, this is lesson 10, so there's 10 lessons, and review them, and that way it keeps it fresh, and then when we move on, we, uh, you will have a, a greater understanding. It's important to go through these uh, uh, seven uh, churches, through, through the letters of these seven churches, because remember, the book of Revelation was written to them and to us. And it is very, very important because we are at the last days. We've come to the end of, the, of, of a sense and the church history up to now, and then we move on into the into the history. So God bless you all, and uh, we pray that you'll be blessed and be a blessing to others. Thank you for being with me, and hope to see you, hope that we get together again soon. God bless.